Um, I want to thank you all for joining us for another little talk. I am so thrilled to be presenting these two ladies tonight. They are two women who I admire beyond belief. And mm -hmm. the whole um, point of the Little Shadows, well, Little Shadow itself is meant to shine light on interesting people and interesting topics. And the point of this series is to put two people in conversation who um, have interesting points of view, um, who come from divergent backgrounds that in some ways cross and give them a, a platform to kind of get to know each other and share. Um, so we're, we mm -hmm. will go ahead and uh, have these two ladies have their conversation for about 45 minutes. If you have any questions or comments along the way, feel free to put them in the chat below. And when we get to the end of the evening, we will uh, introduce you and invite you into the room. Okay. Um, so thank you all for being here. And without further ado, I would love to introduce two incredible string musician composer ladies, <laughs> Dawn Avery and Melissa Dumphy. Welcome, ladies. Hi. Thank you. Hi. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining. Um, Dawn, you, we should do like the quick like like two minute bio or something for everyone so that they know a little bit about who we are. What's your, what's your like live story in like My a tiny sound story. bite? Yeah, <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> well, we're both here as composers. I yeah. didn't even know that Melissa was a string player uh, until about three I try ago. not to advertise it because I don't practice as much as I should. Yeah, so, <laughs> yeah. So I feel like, you know, when I say I'm a string player, people expect me to be like, you know, amazing whiz bang kind of um, like super technical, amazing string player. And I'm just like, oh, I'm just a violist. I can improvise. <laughs> Improvisation is good. <laughs> Improvisation is good. And so few string players do it, I feel, right? Like, w like when, when, how old were you when you started playing music? Uh, I started playing cello when I was 17, which was pretty late. Wow. I was yeah. a pianist first and I composed when I was young. So that was pretty late for cello, yeah. but I did start improvising young at a young age, but I, it was a different kind of improv. Maybe I studied with uh, David Darling for a long time uh -huh. and he really had this open form of improv. I'm not, um, you know, I'm not a jazz Im improviser. That's a whole other world. Technical language. Right. Yeah. But I did study at Manhattan School of Music and I had a conservatory training. And yeah. so most of the music I write is, um, has elements of classical music, elements of down tempo, elements of theater, um, a lot of sacred chant that I use in my writing. So that comes through, right? And a lot yeah. of strings. I love writing for strings. Me too. Yeah, I feel so. I started piano when I was very little, um, mm. like four. My mom took me to Yamaha piano classes um, because she had read somewhere that learning music makes you better at math and science and she wanted me to be a doctor when I grew up and unfortunately it seems that I took to the music like way more than I took to the math and science <laughs> but, but um uh I I was never very good at piano I found like it wasn't um I guess I just really didn't practice enough but it wasn't until I picked up a violin when I was seven that I was like, oh, and I think for two reasons. One, I feel like when you play the piano, um, it's like far more of a solitary activity. You know, it's like you, you expect, you can just practice yeah. piano by yourself. Whereas when I played the violin, it was like ensemble work and chamber music. And, you know, you have to play with other people. You have to have an accompanist or, you know, at least. So that was cool. And the other thing was, I feel like my musical brain is much more melody driven. Um, mm. And if, and I guess I, I just don't have the galaxy brain for like having too many melodies, like too, <laughs> too many, many lines. Notes at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> people are like why, did, why didn't you like piano i'm like oh i just don't like reading two clefs at once and i'm not coordinated enough to play both right and left hand at the same That's time funny. <laughs> so so did you when when you took up when did you when did you decide you were going to be a composer uh i i started composing in high school i wrote some pieces when i my mother um my mother was a single mother we were super poor she uh -huh. had to go back to college so she could get work to raise her three girls. And so she went to these concerts for her class and had to write 
write about them. Uh -huh. So I would go to the concerts with her and then I would write about them for her because she had too much other homework. Stuff, right? yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so I went to the New Music Consort in New York, who I later ended up playing with. Oh my gosh. College. But at that time, I had never heard music like this. I was so blown away by contemporary classical music. Yeah. And right after that, I, I started writing, not a lot, but I started writing pretty avant-garde for the, you know, for the time, right? Yeah. That I knew. And then uh, my father is a drummer, bebop drummer, but he he was with uh, the Lenny Tristano Trio for years, which is oh a gosh. cool school of jazz, which is a very unusual yeah. and uh, kind of jazz that uses a lot of classical elements too. So, you know what? Let me interrupt real quick because I see people coming in, and I just want to say hi. Yeah, and, hi. Uh, put questions in the Q and A because our awesome moderator Jean Marie Kevins will keep track of those, and then. Um, toward the end yeah and then go through them later or if someone so, has a really burning question that i see pop up in the chat i'll be like wait we should stop yeah, and answer that question yeah, <laughs> so how about you when did you start composing so i was a late composer and i actually last week i recorded this youtube video all about this because this is a topic that i'm really passionate about i feel like the way that if you study mainly classical music which i did really I was like all classical until my late teens, pretty much. Mm. I really feel like there was almost zero encouragement to compose your own mm. stuff. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, like like the the thing that I, you know, as an adult looking back, the, the things I, I start to get mad about it because I'm like, you know, I played concerto, you know, um, concerti, and I was never give I was never told to compose my own cadenzas, but actually I should have been. Right, like, right, and that's how it was originally done. Right, which you never taught that. Nobody's taught that anymore. It's, it's like you just play the cadenza that's on the page, mm -hmm. and that's not that's not how it should be. And then you know, other times I think, like I, I remember one time, I was not, I was, I had a really good ear, so I was very bad at sight reading music because I would hear something once and then I would just go by ear mm -hmm. and not read the notes on the page anymore. So I, I kind of sucked at sight reading for a long time until my mid teens, I like sat down and forced myself to do it. Um, but uh, there was like one time that I was playing some, I don't know, Kreutzer study or something. And I basically like made up the ending. And I remember my teacher like lovingly saying to me like, that was really cool, but not what was on the page. So if you could please just play the notes right. that are on the page, because that's what you have to do. Yeah, that's interesting. Right, and I did. Are, don't you think people are more encouraged now to, to write their own music? And I think it depends what tradition, like still in the classical world, mm -hmm. I don't think it's, it's great. Probably true. Um, so yeah, I wrote, the, I, I recorded this video last week where I basically just got really mad and talked about how I hate that situation in classical music. And I got a lot of responses from people who were like, I've never thought about this. And, mm -hmm. and it's true. And the only reason I think that I started composing, um, is in my late teens, I started playing with, I, I basically broke up with classical music. Like I got really frustrated with, <laughs> with how stuffy it was and, and mm -hmm. technical technique obsessed. And, uh, and I pl started playing with rock bands and mm -hmm. uh, I played, too. yes, <laughs> <laughs> which is so different from that like conservatory yes. world. Yeah. And I always mixed it up, I have to admit. And I was yeah. not this great classical cellist. Right. I mean, I played with some, you know, with New Jersey Symphony and with Pavarotti. I mean, I played with great people, sure. but I wasn't like the, the soloist uh, classical person. And the thing that I hated the most was that the audition process. <sighs> I yes. just thought it was, it felt so inhumane. <laughs> yes. As opposed to when you're collaborating with a group of people, you know, playing, playing rock music or jazz or whatever style, right. because it's a collaboration with other yes. people. So there's a give and take that you feel that I felt more. Yeah. I can't say I didn't always feel that. I mean, I've played Brahms trios and felt it. Like, yes. Amazing. But then, but yeah, the audition everybody. process. Not everybody. Yeah. yeah. So the, that's part of why I did lesson. No, <laughs> for sure. I'm so yeah. with you. I'm so with you. Like, I just started to feel like, like it, it became, a, it's like a contest to be the yeah. technical best. And right. like, I messed up one note in a recital and I was inconsolable. Like I, I stepped off the stage after mm. this big viola um, recital uh, in my senior year of high school and I just burst into tears and I was inconsolable mm -hmm. because I missed one right. note kind of thing and it's I like I understand and that you, I always felt like you had to play like everybody else especially 
when you're younger, you have to sound like the best of everybody. Yeah. Right. And it's so, like, but with classical composers, are there some that have really inspired you in terms of, or, or rock or theater or uh, that have inspired your composition? Like who uh, are some? So, <laughs> do you want to hear something funny? So when I was a little kid, <laughs> I was so obsessed with Mozart, but the reasons I was obsessed with Mozart was I watched the film Amadeus when I was really mm -hmm. little, and I was really um, into the fact that Mozart told poop and fart jokes and <laughs> was also writing all this amazing music. So like at age six, I was like, oh, he's, he's funny. Like, he's funny. I like him. Like, I... <laughs> <laughs> he talks about fads and maybe I can do that too you know so and then you know I read some of his letters and his like he wrote like poems about farting to his mom like that was you know there you that, go. he was a real person he, yes <laughs> and that was part of what I loved about it and then you know getting into like his funny music like musical jokes and you know just mm. all of this like crude stuff that I I loved that you know breaking down that image of the composer as you know, some kind of infallible God, like Virgin right. Mary type figure that and is... inaccessible to understand. Yes, and, yeah. Exactly. It was like I loved the... Beethoven because he when he ran out of paper, he wrote on the wall. <laughs> when I was a kid, I just thought that was awesome. And that he went around like and his hair was wild was my... and you know, like I yes. <laughs> one time he got really mad at his housekeeper because she kept interrupting him and she he threw eggs at her. Yeah. <laughs> Like, like no coffee all over his music and then right I'm nice like, stuff and, yeah. the messy <laughs> human side of composing I That's was super so into funny. yes and then <laughs> and then when I quit well not quit but like basically I stopped practicing for you know three hours a day and I started um getting into other genres of music and you know actually I want to say like the first thing like the most liberating thing about getting away from classical music was uh and I I tried to play a little jazz I'm no I'm not very good at it but I played like jazz viola in a club in Sydney for a while and mm -hmm. the most amazing thing to me was you can make a mistake you can play a bum note and you just laugh and the audience laughs with you and then mm -hmm. they're behind you because they see that you're human and I had never experienced that oh, as a performer until I started doing that. Um, so yeah, then I got really, really into like industrial music and uh, Nine Inch Nails. Um, oh, cool. Nine Inch Nails changed my life. I married <laughs> because my husband and I met over a mutual love of Nine Inch Nails. And that's why I came <laughs> oh, to America. Good. Yeah, it's, oh, it, yeah, Trent Reznor changed my life. It's really weird so to I say. I um, toured with John Cale from the Velvet Underground. You know, oh. And I used to have a shaved head, wear old leather, and yes. I'd play, I'd hold my cello like behind my neck. And so I think that's one thing about being a composer today that is so great is that we can have so many influences mm -hmm. and experiences in different types of music. And I mean, yes. now even more so because you can hear anything and everything online, right? It could probably get to be a lot for people. But to actually have the experience of so many different kinds of music and being a performer and a composer, mm -hmm. I, I feel really um, grateful for that. Yeah, me know? too. Yeah. I, I feel like if I if I had been, I mean, for many reasons, if I had been born, you know, seventy years ago and come into come into the world of composing while serialism was king and nobody could you know mm. touch tone, tonalism right mm. when it was like you're not supposed to write pretty music everything has to be under the system to to like divest it of all of those dangerous romantic nationalistic feelings which I understand right. but I, I like I feel like if I had come into that I would never have been a composer mm. So um, I'm showing my age. I actually worked with those guys, with Charles Warren and Elliot Carter and Milton sure. Abbott. And so I, I did write 12 tone music for a little while. And Ursula Mamlock, there was a uh, woman 12 tone writer. Uh, was awesome. yeah. <laughs> and um, so I wrote in that style for a while. And honestly, it was fascinating. The way I can imagine it is when you see a mathematician who's really an artist, yeah. like the true mathematician. So to get yes. that deeply, into grids and science and the mathematics of notes where it actually reveals other types of vibration was sure. amazing but yeah 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 <laughs> i did though at, at a certain point 
it wasn't for me. It felt like it was too much in my head. I couldn't, I wasn't in my heart most of the time. I was in my head and I was in this like, but I wasn't like deeply in my heart connecting to other people. For sure. So yeah. for me, it, it had, a, it had an end for me. I still enjoy hearing some of them. Um, I used to be able to play that music. I couldn't even come. I probably couldn't even play one measure now. It's so hard. And I, and it's not for me that oh, to be in my head all the time is not why I write music. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I totally, I totally, totally feel you like, um, uh, you know, and actually when just before Elliot Carter died, mm -hmm. I, I read an interview of him that I found so inspiring, basically mm -hmm. where someone someone asked him, I mean, he was like a hundred or 101 or something, you know, like, and, and he, someone asked him the question, you know, um, does it matter to you if people are still playing your music, you know, into the future, mm -hmm. if people understand your music, you know, and, and I don't know why I think part of me expected him to have a different answer to this, but instead he said something like, no, it doesn't matter. Like I'm, I'm grateful people understand it now and I've had this great life so oh, like it doesn't and I just yeah it just seemed like a really humble real human response to that it's question beautiful. also he does you know it is the kind of idea where you're in the present right yeah and he did sort of strike me as a kind of person that was in the present moment sure that's wow that's i know i know i really I liked that, that. Yeah, i know really nice. and i've met i've met george crumb of course i did my phd mm. at penn so oh, okay. there was still like this aura of like yes. george crumb and rock and i love to just prepare piano stuff and yeah the way he'd amplify instruments you know, and play with stuff to do that right Yes. Yeah. And, and it's playful. That's the thing yeah. I think people forget is that serialism, even like Berg and, and, uh, and Crumb, you know, it can be playful as well mm -hmm. as, you know, all of these like very serious scientific, like, you know, we have to do this systemized, systematized thing, right. but like some of the music, it's just, it's, it's not, it's, it's not about that. That's just a tool to get them there but actually it's about playing it's about gesture it's about emotion um right. and those are the those are the serialist composers that i really like um but the thing that frightened me i think when i first started at penn i was really frightened that i would be if i was still I, what year did i start at penn 2009 i was still mm -hmm. a little worried that i would be expected to write in a very serious academic style. Uh, yeah, no, I could see being afraid of that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it still goes on until maybe, you know, when you judge um, competitions mm -hmm. and maybe out of 40 compositions, 35 of them have that huge dissonant chord at the beginning for years, that was the case. I mean, I sure. think maybe that only changed, you know, recently <laughs> 10, yeah. 15, 10 years ago probably so sure. yeah that still goes on right so I right. hear you I hear you and I never actually studied composition I just really with all these guys as performers so that's great I absorbed a ton of ideas and music and then um I think my biggest influence probably was John Cage yes because he was so open and the experimenting with sound and prepared piano and that really appealed to me but uh, but I mean, I was fortunate to be around a huge group in New York at the time. So I had so many influences that in a way it helped me to find my own, my own sure. voice, right? To just yeah. be bombarded and then you just swim through and take what you like and leave the rest kind of thing. Right? Which is so, like, basically I feel like the whole New York downtown composing scene paved the way for breaking away from that kind of rigid academic system. And yeah. it's the reason why, Absolutely. you know, as composers now, we can play with puppet shows, we can play in rock bands, we can arrange for, you know, right. like rock stars, we can do film scores, I can write a jazz standard if I want to, and nobody's going to go like, you're not allowed to do that, you have to right. be serious. <laughs> and I think so many, so many people in the world listen to so many different kinds of music, like the, the average playlist isn't the classical and the <clears throat> punk right. rock or the right. whatever, right? Like people have a, a such a huge mixture now. I really appreciate that, especially even my college students. Like they'll have them set by mood or by day of the week or by when they work out. And then they'll have all genres in within one playlist. 
That's it's so a whole great. different way of learning and thinking. And I, I know what you mean. When we go to school, a lot of times you're you're set in these boxes, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And I understand that they want to teach us all this stuff. And sure. <laughs> yeah. But then, but then we get to break away. That's the point. That's really <laughs> yeah. I mean, so I didn't I didn't decide to become a composer until I was 24, and it oh. was um, I was an actor uh, in a Shakespeare festival, Harrisburg Shakespeare Festival in a production of A Midsummer Night's Dream. And the composer had to drop out of the show with no music written, it was an emergency. So the director came to me and said, please, Melissa, you're a musician, please, will you compose all of the songs for this show? And I was like, ah, okay, I'll try. Yeah. And it was during one of those late night sessions. I mean, it was like a weird universe epiphany. Like, you know, how sometimes it's just like, you do something and the universe is like, this is it, this is it. Yes. You've, you think this is what you need to be doing. Um, and so at 24, I didn't have any, I didn't have a college degree or anything, but I, I was like, how do I become a composer? I like Googled how to oh, wow. become composer. I don't, I don't know what to do. Like I've, I've not, I haven't had any guidance. I don't have anyone uh. to follow. Um, and Google was like, you should probably go to grad school. And I was like, well, I guess I have to start with undergrad. So I started my undergrad, um, at 24. Oh, uh, that's awesome. And that's like, a great story. Which, you know what, I'm like, I'm actually really glad in some ways, in a lot of ways, that I came to it later and outside of the, like, the pipeline that's mm -hmm. like, you should be a child prodigy, and then you should go to conservatory, and then you should get your master's, and then you should just become yeah. a professional composer, and you don't have time to live because you're too busy like right. practicing and studying and writing music and like now compose. Cause I feel like I've seen so many of those composers just burn out of their careers really early. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, I've, I've composed for a while, but honestly I'm composing more the last 10 years than I ever have. Yeah. And now during this whole uh, quarantine, I'm composing so much. I, I feel so grateful like to be able to compose. Okay, so you have to tell working. us, tell yeah. us what you're composing. Uh, one piece I just finished last week actually is "Love in the Time of COVID," Yoji Stoke Walunyu. So this duo, concertante from Newfoundland, Labrador, oh, wow. asked me to write a, a piece that was about love during the pandemic, and so I thought of you know, love in the time of cholera. So, but then I thought of in, um, I'm of Mohawk heritage. So I thought of in my heritage, Yoji Stokwalunyo are the stars and how we're all, um, no matter what's going on in our life, no matter what's going on in the world, we can all connect by way of the sky world and the stars. Yeah. And in our tradition, the idea of the stars is that they decorate the sky to remind us of beauty. And they decorate Grandmother Moon as if it's like her sparkly dress, you know. Sure. And then the other idea of that we're born from the from the stars and we go back through the stars. So, so yeah, I've really enjoyed that piece, and I use a lot of prepared piano in it and a lot of harmonics and sparkly sounds. I wanted to go for sparkle and beauty. Oh my gosh! So wait, wait, what's the instrumentation? So time. It's violin and, and piano by this amazing duo, international duo who are very involved with um, environmental, the ecology of being, like environmental works. Yeah. Classical music having to do with the environment. So I've done a few pieces for them now, and they're very dedicated to composers who are working with environment, sounds, um, different styles. It's, yeah, it's pretty neat. That's so, so cool. I would like you to share your story of the latest thing you're, you've been doing. <laughs> we have this opera thing in common too, which is yeah. so strange because that's sort of new for me writing <laughs> short operas. I was like, so yeah, so tell us about your opera. Okay, so, you know, I actually, I wrote like the first act of an opera for my dissertation at Penn, um, but it's a huge opera. So it's mm. probably, it, it won't get produced until I'm like so rich and famous that people go back through my catalog and look right. at, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> okay. cause it's like full size chorus and full size orchestra. And I know as I'm writing it, I'm like, oh man, this is my first opera. <laughs> They're not gonna perform it until I have like 10 operas under my belt. Um, <laughs> but um, so uh, recently, I guess a year ago, I was commissioned by Oberlin Conservatory 
um, to write a like a one act or so 70 ish minute opera. Um, and uh, they paired me with a local playwright here in Philly, Jackie Goldfinger, who's an amazing, I love her, I love her so much. Um, she's been on the Kilroy's list a bunch of times, mm. the list of plays by women that need to be produced and mm-hmm. aren't produced because society is sexist, hey. Uh, and uh, <laughs> so she and I put our heads together and we were like, what do we want to write an opera about? And I turned out, I have like a hopper of ideas every time. I mean, I guess you probably do this too, where it's just like, you think of like, you're having conversation with someone, you think, man, that would make a really good piece one day. And like, mm-hmm. I, jo- I like put a post-it note in a thing. Um, so uh, long story short, um, I'm really interested in local history and archeology. span And I've become an amateur archeologist myself or a mm-hmm. citizen archeologist as I like to call myself. Um, and I discovered while researching the property that I live on, that I own, um, the story of a woman who died on my property in 1880. She's the only recorded death on my property. And the newspaper stories of the time said her name was Alice Tierney. She was 45 years old. She was a quote unquote dissipated woman, which I guess means sex worker. And yeah, she was drinking with her girlfriends, scandalous women drinking together, drinking with her girlfriends in their like grotty little tenement flat at the back of my building. Um, And they ran out of alcohol. So she left to go get some more and didn't come back. And then the next morning, a woman two doors down threw open her back kitchen windows and saw poor Alice Tierney strung up upside down on the back fence of my property strangled and dead Mm. and in the newspaper article it's Mm. and the police report it says she must have tried to climb over the fence to get some more alcohol and her clothes got Mm. tangled up in the fence and she struggled and accidentally accidentally strangled herself to death and of course Mm. yeah of course as soon as you read that you're like, what a load of malarkey, as our (laughs) current president would say. What absolute hogwash. This woman was murdered. Um, This was Mm -hmm. eight years before Jack the Ripper happened in London. So I think it it wasn't like salacious enough to say a sex worker has been murdered in Mm -hmm. what was at the time like the Tenderloin district of Philadelphia, just the worst Mm -hmm. part of the the city. Um, So it was ignored. And after I read that story, I mean, I got chills and I, every time, every time a funny creak or a funny noise happens in my house, I shout out, you know, Alice, Alice, I'm going to find a way to like, to do you right. Honor, and to honor give, your, yes, honor your, your story, lineage, your legacy. Yeah. Here some measure of justice. And so I told the story to Jackie and Jackie was like, oh my gosh, we have to make an opera about her, but I'm doing the opera from the perspective of four archeologists who are excavating the property and discovering her story through the objects that they found, mm. that they find. And each of the archeologists have a totally different concept of who Alice is because whenever somebody tells a story the way that they tell the story and the way that they frame the story and the things that they think are important in the story says as much about the storyteller as it does about the subject of the story so it's really a big picture kind of I mean I'm I don't know how I'm going to cram all this into 70 minutes actually but I'm going to (laughs) try it's like a big picture thing about how I mean, we're grappling with this now, right? It's like, what is the story of America? What is the story mm-hmm. of our land? Where does that story start? Mm-hmm. And who is telling the story is really into, like it's central to who we are as a nation. And we've kind of been telling ourselves lies for a couple centuries. And now in the 21st century, we're just starting to like scratch the surface of like, what is the story of America actually about mm. on a mainstream level? So, so one, one thing that I love um, that you said yesterday, we, we spoke for like, you know, 15 minutes or something yesterday, but there was something you said that about how many people having heard this story are now researching their own land, the land yes. underneath their own home, which yeah. this is such a beautiful way to look at land. Because from my perspective, I look at Mother Earth, I look at how you honor the earth. A lot of my songs are about stories in relationship to the earth. 
And so you're talking about the same thing on a t in a totally different way, right? Sure. Yeah. But there, it's just it's still a way for us to have relationship with where we live, with ourselves, with the perspective of other histories. Yeah. Right. With our own movement, like now, so many people have moved and are changing their lifestyle and. I, I'm fascinated by watching how the movements, the migrations of priorities, but also of land and where we live People, are yeah. shifting. They're already shifting a lot due to this pandemic in, yeah. in large part, right? So this is a whole other level that you're talking about that becomes so personal. And it is a big story of America. I mean, for me, the United States, you know, I I often look at the the earlier stories, right? Sure because of my because of my history but then to look at i, I also have you know migrant people yep. in my family too right i'm a mix so then you you're looking at this that level of it too like who traveled through who created right. america so tell a little bit of the story of what you found okay with your land because this is like <laughs> talk about relationship and <laughs> stories like we both like to tell stories in our music yeah. right i feel like that's what i do as an artist it's storytelling you know it's, yeah, it's that's too. absolutely what it comes down to stories mm -hmm. are who we are um, so our weird story that has affected my husband and my life, um, <laughs> immeasurably in the last five years is we, we discovered a real estate listing about five years ago for a magic theater, a, a theater where magic shows were held. It had just shut down because the owner had gone to jail and, uh, it went, it was, it was being foreclosed on. And, you know, obviously I'm very involved in theater. My husband is a punk drummer actually. And, oh. uh, so he would love somewhere to play his drums. <laughs> and, uh, and so we, we basically, we were 35 at the time. And it was like, this is the last time in our life really that it would be not safe, but not completely foolish to gamble everything we have on a mm -hmm. dream and still have something left for retirement if it all fails. So we sold everything we had and bought <laughs> this magic theater. Um, and then, you know, basically got ourselves up to hock up to our eyeballs to afford construction on this incredibly rundown property it was mm. a gut job. Uh, so we dug into the foundation of the building and we discovered not one, but two privies, which are toilet pits from the 1800s, filled with thousands of artifacts from <laughs> around about the period of the Revolutionary War. Um, and uh, we became amateur archaeologists excavating all of this stuff. And, you know, I tell people like it took me two years longer than it should have to finish my PhD because I got so sidetracked on this stuff like I would come into my my composition lessons and my te my poor frustrated teachers are like what did you do this week I'm like well have I got some fun stuff to show you and I would tell them about all the things I dug <laughs> and what I'd learned about ceramics and like people coming from England and, like, and they're like and what does this have to do with the uh the opera about the sex life of Ayn Rand that you're supposedly writing right now. I'm like, nothing, it has nothing to do with it, but that's what I did this week. Uh, they were very frustrated. Um, <laughs> so, um, so, but you know, really what fascinated me was discovering, and I'd never thought to do this before, discovering that I could learn through research and the internet is a big part of this too, learn about the people who had occupied this space before me and how mm -hmm. far back I could mm -hmm. go in the records and how much I could learn about their lives through history and through archaeology. And I honestly, it's like, I don't know if it's, no, in Australia, they, 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 this attitude is there too. It's almost like, like we want, like the mo modern people want to buy a brand new house that has no history and, mm -hmm. and just live in like a brand new place and pretend like this is a virgin piece of ground that has no history behind it. Right. But of course that's- And what a loss too, what a loss, because right. then again, you're losing the relationship, you're not honoring the ancestors and the land that could be give you so much richness and support, right? Yes, yeah. yes. I, and then I you don't respect the environment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I feel, yeah, I feel like right. this is, you know, at the root of when you start to invest emotionally in your in your property and then your neighborhood and you know the history of your neighborhood then it becomes like 
I would never, I would, I, I don't want to pollute my neighborhood. I don't want to litter. I don't want, you know, I want it to be better. I want to honor the land. I want to like, you know, mm. be, make this land the best that it can be to honor all of the people whose footsteps I'm treading in to get here and like what it took them to be in, in the space, you know, and now my own journey as, a, as an immigrant to America you know, mm-hmm. living in Connects space. you on a whole other level. Yeah. And it's such a beautiful way of honoring that you came here and that now you're part of here. I mean, it's right. such, that's a beautiful way to honor it. I love it. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I encourage everybody listening to this to like try and find out like who lived in your house before what remnants of them are left behind who lived on your land, you know, like go back as far as you can. The stories will will blow your mind like I just every single person whose story I've discovered is like a fascinating person and you can find out all this stuff from the records like you know the guy who owned my property during the revolutionary war Daniel Williams he and his wife um, his wife gave birth 15 times and 10 of her children died in infancy and trying to and yet you know he ran his own business and they had like a farm and you know they were successful people but just trying to think about what it was like to to live through that and survive I mean it's like it's inspiring and it's humbling and it's beautiful to think about it and you can still see the remnants of them around the city and I'm just "Ah, I love it I love it so much (laughs) you know the uh, the other thing that I think about with land is is the sound of the land yeah. Right. Like what what are the sounds around you that people don't pay attention to or they they let themselves be drowned out by uh, lawnmowers <laughs> or, you know, the trucks going by that. And then they want to block everything out. So to really listen deeply to the sounds of your own land is is something pretty profound. And I, I mean, I've studied a lot of music from different sacred traditions and really have been privileged to work with some amazing uh, spiritual leaders and a lot of them when they talk about music they talk about the mysticism of music but they also talk about like the pulse of the earth and how it relates to when we write music and you sure. know every tradition talks about the same actually even the same speed oh like whoa. Between, between 60 and 80 is the actual like almost like a heartbeat yeah of of the earth and you hear this from the aboriginals you hear this from the sufis in the mystic Middle Eastern, you know, tradition of Sufism, and you hear it in some of the native, um, a lot of the native um, American, the old chants huh. are in that tempo. Yeah. So like there's a tempo too to not only learning deeply about where you are, but to listening and being part of the vibration, right, of where yeah. you are. So there's so many love, so many ways to go in though, and I love your way of going in because it's unusual. Uh, and it, I mean, and it was given to you, right? That's it was just like, it, yes. But you also received it. That's the other thing. A lot of us are given things. And, and I think it's happened to all of us at different times in our life. Sure. And we are not ready to receive it or right. we don't know how to receive it. Once and we receive it, it, we may just blow it away. Right, 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 right. right. So I feel like during this time, it, for some people who have had the, you know, maybe the privilege of being able to take some time. Yeah. Right when we're forced to take some time too, that we can actually look at what we really want or look at what's really there. Yes. Maybe not what we really want, but what's I, really there. Right. There's something about slowing down to do that. Oh, a hundred percent. It is so bad, easy. Right? Yeah. It, it's so easy to get so busy and wrapped up in stuff that I mean, it matters, but ultimately if you're at the end <laughs> of your life, looking back, how much does it matter? It, right. It's like, yeah. A question I ask myself all the time when I'm, you know, freaking out about some deadline or something that's, you know, really small. It's like, wait a second. Yeah. yeah. What am I spending my life energy on right now? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> do you do you get um do you feel like you have to get into nature to really connect with the land in that way? Like, do you or um, or do you feel like not, it's not possible? always, honestly not always i mean i appreciate that i live in a beautiful place but Mm -hmm. when i lived in manhattan i mean there are so many fascinating things like underground tunnels and i mean there are ways to get connected to the land with concrete (laughs) i felt like anyway it was sort of a mystery you know yeah um i wanted to there is a question here oh um so 
a fellow storyteller here. This is Marley. And um, she says, why did you decide to write your opera from the perspective of modern people interpreting the story of the woman that lived in your house versus from her own perspective? This is such a great question. Yeah. And I have a, I have several different answers to it too. I think they all dovetail, but like one of the answers is, I don't, I actually doubt that I can tell, I can fully encompass her perspective because of the reasons that I've said, mm -hmm. because, you know, I don't really know what it's like to be a 45 year old poor Irish sex worker in 1880. Like I, it's, it's really hot, you know, yes, there are something going to be some things that are universal, but how I choose to tell that story is going to say so much about like my politics and my mm -hmm. perspective and my, you know, my agenda for how I want the world to be. And I think that that right now, what's fascinating to me about storytelling is the fact that it is that, that like what is truth you know mm -hmm. like how how do we get to truth how do we find truth should we all actually even be striving for truth or should we accept that truth can be mutable in mm -hmm. stories like this you know mm -hmm. like there's so little information about Alice Tierney basically what I have is her death that's it mm -hmm. anything else that I say about her I'm making up and uh you know I'm also you know, I'm, here's, this, here's the truth about opera. There's a lot of opera about, that are tragic stories about 19th century sex workers who die. Mm, yeah. <laughs> like, there's a lot of it. Yeah. And, and it, there's a tendency to romanticize that story. There's a right. tendency for the story to become basically like misogynist trauma porn. Mm -hmm. There's, you know, there's a lot of bad racist sexist tendencies in opera as an art form that we are living with in the 21st century as a result of the opera canon. So part of my impetus to come at it from this angle is to deconstruct that a little bit. And, and the different layers of truth than the listener picks the parts that they resonate with. That's yeah. what we can really do. Ultimately, that's what we're all doing, right? We're interpreting as the creator and as the listener who's creating a whole other story, right? It's such, right? A, it's such an amazing uh, relationship. So I have, I have some overlapping things here because I just started an opera about Sacagawea. Yes. And, uh, you know, part, part of what I'm really been dedicated to is how do you indigenize music, the musical process. And you can do this with the audience. You can do this with how you write. You can do this with how you collaborate with the audience, the space the story, right? So there's so many layers to indigenizing something or a lot of people like to call it decolonizing. And um, and we could also say it's demasculating <laughs> or something. I don't know. I don't know the right word for that. But getcha. Because yeah. Saka, yeah, Sacagawea's story is always told, you know, through the eyes of men and especially through Lewis and Clark. Mm -hmm. Now, granted, they really appreciated her and in many ways they treated her very well and they mm. honored her and there's other stories too right to this as we all know and uh but one of the one of the pieces to this that's so important to me is that i won't write write this unless i talk to the shoshone people mm. because that's where she was raised that's who she belongs to that was her worldview yeah it's not the worldview of somebody who again is interpreting it through western eyes right Right. And that process often takes a long time to get to know elders in a tribe. There's a whole honoring protocol. And so mm -hmm. it's it's an interesting process to see how, again, to tell the story. And the librettist is really um, intent on telling the story as much as she can through Sacagawea's eyes. But who knows Sacagawea's eyes but Sacagawea? Right. right. So as a modern day feminist, which this woman is a beautiful writer, beautiful singer, beautiful feminist, right? Very strong, intelligent woman. So as a modern day feminist, she is going to write it through the bias of a modern day feminist. And to be a Native American woman to me is ultimately the feminist, but it's not the definition of what we call it today. Yeah. Does that make sense? No, totally. So, yeah. so it, I, I like this. I like, like how do you how do you tell? It's not even truth that we're telling, really. Right. But we are trying to tell, tell a story that people resonate with aspects of truth. Does that make sense? Marley, Marley, I'd love to know what you think. Could you weigh in on this one? <laughs> weigh in on the chat. Oh, turn your, turn weigh your... in on the chat. Yeah, because... 
it's it, it's totally i mean stories change you know stories yeah. stories in some ways they stay the same for thousands of years and and yet they change because of who tells the story and who hears the and who story hears it how right? yeah, yeah. Uh, like i remember my mom telling me my you know i i grew up in a chinese family um uh my mom uh, swam from China to Hong Kong when she was 22 to escape the cultural revolution and you know came to Australia Mm -hmm. eventually and I remember her telling me the story of Mulan when I was a little girl really and uh you know well before the Disney movie the way she told the story was was look at this amazing woman she was amazing because she sacrificed for her father Mm -hmm. and that is what is amazing like according to sort of chinese cultural values Mm -hmm. children who are willing to sacrifice everything for Mm -hmm. their ancestors and their parents and of course now we have like the americanized mulan which is like she's this feminist woman who can sort of do anything that a man can do yes without the lineage without the yeah right and and who am i to take that away from anybody because Mm -hmm. you know who can tell what Mulan was thinking at the time and stories change, you know, and that's, that's the story that we have chosen to tell, but I don't, you know, I'm just, I'm so fascinated by the way stories unfold in history. So I think um, Jean Marie, Jean Marie is nearby. Yes. Might want to, might want to weigh in or ask something or. Hi, I (laughs) do want to ask, I do want to ask something. And also, um, you know, this conversation really got me going because there was a, a play that I co-wrote years ago that um, was based on a true story of seven little people who survived the Holocaust and mm. they've all passed, right? Mm. And I'm Irish and Jewish descent and yeah. third, second generation American, like, who am I? Yeah. So mm. we gathered people you know, and we, we created our own, um, like council of elders and advisors, right. That mm-hmm. we could get to who are most appropriate to help us tell the story. And, um, in telling the story, each character's point of view, it was, it was meant to be one of this family's points of view, but we made sure to showcase the Nazi point of view and mm-hmm. the Nazi sympathizer point of view and show me all the spaces around this mm-hmm. family story. And uh, when we got to the end, it was just her on stage and she's, you know, totally stereotyped. We've got to like wrap this show up real fast. We're American. We've got two minutes left. So um, you know, we've got 90 minutes on this stage and we've got a stripe. So she had like a phone call where she had an argument with somebody. But you couldn't tell if she was defending the Nazis who let her survive. Oh, wow. Like you, you couldn't tell, but that was her true story. We had videotape of that, right? Mm. Whoa. So, so we, we changed the words to get it into, you know, a succinct thing, but it was, it was her story. And afterwards, people were coming to us asking us, um, do we think that she had Stockholm syndrome? Do we <sighs> think, and they were asking us all these things and we, everybody, we all talked, mm. you know, beforehand, all, the entire creative team about what is our answer to these questions? Mm. and our our responses were what do you think yeah perfect perfect because i don't know this person but we planned specifically as the show grew and was developed to to only do it in places that had bars purely Mm. because we wanted people to gather afterwards and stay and talk and talk see that's that's a really great story isn't it one that just gets you talking and thinking yeah. That's wow. That's I got and, goosebumps well, from that. Listening one. to what each of you were saying, it just took me back to that experience mm-hmm. of saying, like, I don't know. I'm just Which is so it. much more interesting than yes. here is a really simple story, and you know how it goes, and here's the ending, and you know exactly right. what everyone's motivations are, and mm-hmm. tie a bow on it and put it away. You know, mm-hmm. it's like in all of my storytelling that I've my big big s storytelling that I've done, I love diving into characters who are complicated and not you know like they're not um what do you call it like like Marianne like kind of characters that are just good all the time Pollyanna type thing Mm -hmm. and they're not super evil all the time but they have to be both because we all are you know we've all got the capacity 
for all of those things. Ah. So I, I was really in, uh, enjoying listening to each of you speak about that um, diving into of the storytelling. And the one thing that, that I kept hearing you say that is what made me turn that camera on and like, I've got a question before we have to wrap <laughs> is about collaboration. You're both mm. talking about collaborating with the material, collaborating mm. with the planet and collaborating with other living beings around you mm -hmm. and to me I think that's what I connect to when I am in a space with either of you and mm -hmm. I never feel like that's that's not the time to discuss it right it's the time mm -hmm. to be with it and kind of commune with it and I would love to hear each of you talk about um, collaboration and what that means for you and I know that's a, like a big loaded question but if you could like give a more <laughs> <laughs> uh, distinct answer, but I know it's a big question, but I'm just well, curious. Uh, that. Yeah, no, that that's one of the most beautiful questions there are because we're human beings who have yeah. the privilege to create, right? Mm -hmm. So for me, there's it's there's so many levels as as there is for everybody on this on this uh, event here, and um, I am definitely connected to source or you know the deeper intelligence, whatever you want to call that. That means so much to me. That's sort of the beginning of it all because that expands us. And then uh, my actual collaborator that I'm working with in this opera as a librettist, uh, we're very give and take in the story and how we feel about it. And so she she can tell me she doesn't like certain sections. I, I can tell her I wish this word could change. Like it's a very give and take relationship. But we really needed to get to know each other first mm -hmm. before we could even start the process. And sometimes that gets cut short. You know, because people have a deadline, right? All the time we have deadlines. So to me, if you don't have that relationship, uh, that's it's not okay. Just like Shoshone protocol, in my the way I was taught, there's protocol. You approach tribal people with a feast and with gifts, and then you get to know them. I mean, really, I should get to know them for a year before I even start asking questions. Now that's not gonna be afforded to me, so I will approach this a little differently. And then I guess the last piece was, um, besides the lamb, because we did talk about that a lot already, is the audience. I do like, I, when I do um, performances or pieces, I treat it like it's a ceremony. So I want everybody to be part of it. Mm -hmm. So I will often embed instrumentalists in the audience or have the audience come on stage and be part of it. Or um, there's usually some ceremonial aspect to the performance for me. So I'll leave, I'll leave it I'll leave it to you now a little Melissa. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know I'm going to like bring it round full circle to like reasons that I pushed back against classical music because I feel like classical mm. music culture is very hierarchical and very mm. like the composer genius god is going to tell you how you do you know you must you must uh, subvert yourself to the composer's vision and then the audience has to like receive the composer's vision and be very still mm. and very like passive about receiving that vision. And the composer should not like should be like implacable marble like isn't allowed to care about any of that kind of thing and i'm so i think because i've come to composing through theater which is not like that at all in, in a lot of ways um i i i care about what the what the audience thinks you know i want to communicate with the audience and i want mm -hmm. that audience feedback which is why covid has been hell on earth uh, obviously <laughs> um and uh and you know, I think of, yes, there's like collaboration, which is very active with people in the room, which is so much like what you described, Dawn, um, with like, you know, that give and take relationship and really under, really trusting, because it's about mm -hmm. trust, I think, mm -hmm. trusting someone else with yourself, because that's what is going into your art. And then there's this collaboration as well, where I'm like, every time someone performs something that I've written, that's a collaboration and they need mm. to bring themselves to that collaboration. Like it shouldn't be people. Sometimes I get into like uh, composer talks with like choirs or whatever. And choirs ask me this question, like, what's the thing that most annoys you about working with um, performance just as like a trivia thing. And I always say it's when a performer thinks that they should just be like a conduit for my genius notes Right. And, and they and they come to me and they're like, so in measure 58, you've written a crescendo. Do you want me to crescendo to mezzo piano or mezzo forte? Is right. this too loud? And sh is it okay if I slow down like two clicks of the metronome, like in this measure? I'm like, 
oh my God, please bring yourself to this conversation. Like, Mm. please collaborate with me by bringing yourself because you are just as much a part of this as I am. I'm just writing the recipe. You are the chef. You bring you, you put your spices that you have in your kitchen that I don't even own into this piece because you're making it for the audience to eat. And then, you know, what, what good is a meal if it's not being eaten? So yeah, that's just, I'm, I'm like collaboration is everywhere and it's at all levels. And even the stuff that you think isn't collaborative should be actually. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Nice. You know, Melissa, that is the perfect, um, wrap up for this evening because I have the entire time thought oh my gosh I never explained why I don't do an introduction and I don't do an introduction because I want people to bring to the table who they want to be that evening and share with each other who they want to share I don't want to say somebody's credentials and therefore that is who they are that is not who they are that's a piece that's a a word on a piece of paper and uh, I think it's really important to take that away in a conversation like this. So I'm so glad you just brought that up because you, you gave me the opportunity to to offer that, uh, that (laughs) that that is why this format. And, um, I want to thank you both for bringing your honesty and your truth and such an interesting conversation. Yeah. Awesome. to be a fly on the wall. Thank you, Jean Marie. You, you know, since I first met you, you have a way of bringing people together and I'm very grateful that you brought us two together, but also that your vision and your you get things done, but you keep with the vision of humanity. And that is just yeah. a wonderful thing. So thank you so much. And a rare thing, a really rare <laughs> thing. Like, you well, know. It can't you... be that rare because there's three of us on that. Oh. Oh, and probably the audience listen to. I would to, assume. Right? I, I see assume. a few people there that, that are like that. Don, sure. I want to be your friend. Okay. <laughs> okay. Also, can we, like, yeah, if you're ever passing through Philly, Please no, hit me wait. up. We're not that uh, we're not that far away. We're really other, not that so far we away. To play. We should we hang out play. and play. And yeah, I got <laughs> my meal. Lee, you too. Yes, we'll meet in the middle. We'll meet in the middle. Okay. Come do some stop. puppets. <laughs> we'll write. Some, we'll improvise some music on the fly. It'll be really chill <laughs> and and collaborative and amazing. And yeah, I I yeah. I want this. This is my vision Beautiful. for the future. Well, thank you. Thanks thank for making this happen. It's been a true pleasure. <laughs> All right. Have a good um, night, everybody. Bye-bye. You too. Thank Bye, you. everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you. Ladies, yes. before we go, my big yes. mistake. Could each of you talk for one minute about um, the group that you are asking? So we also oh, yeah. do this um, in an effort to pay it forward rather than charge a fee for these conversations. We um, amplify the voices of organizations that we believe in. And so each of these ladies have chosen an organization to amplify their voice. And, uh, when this goes onto YouTube, we will put, uh, links to that company, which you can also find on my website. And, um, you can go ahead and support those organizations. So if you each want to take a moment to talk about that, so sorry. The young women, young women composers. Young women composers. Yes. Uh, So I am on the board of an amazing organization here in Philadelphia, um, Young Women Composers Camp, uh, which is a summer program for uh, women and non-binary youth um, who, teenagers, to learn about composing in a safe environment. Um, There's no prerequisites. It's like Mm. the most amazing beautiful collaborative time and just something that I wish I had had when I was that old so you know um so yes please uh support a program like this young women composers they've just become a non-profit so your donations will be tax deductible and uh support the amazing work that they're doing which is now worldwide because it's all virtual (laughs) right awesome and mine is for Montgomery College the World Music Scholarship Fund um, it's a, I am a professor at the school and started a world music program there and the students out of a class of 25, probably 23 of them are from different countries. So a lot of them have moved to the United States, have been here during the whole pandemic and really are struggling financially yeah. to continue going to school, even to just get a laptop or a text. So, uh, these are, this is money is for scholarships that they can continue their schooling and, um, they give such a contribution to the to the world music and culture, you know, for our own uh, knowledge. So, I'm so happy that your college deductible. good. I'm so <laughs> happy so. that your college is have it has that resource because I know at the at the university where I teach, 
the resources for international students are very sparse and mm. there and I know a lot of international students who are having a tough time or new immigrant students who are having a tough time yeah, we so. worked really hard at that yeah yeah, yeah. that that is nice it's also partly the area too right I'm around DC sure so we have a lot of people yeah that's well, great. Thank you. Thanks for setting that up too, Jean Marie. Yes, thank you. And thank you both for your contributions <laughs> to the world. I love you both, and I can't wait to see you love again you. soon. Bye bye. Bye. Bye.